Welcome everybody and uh, I'd like to pick up where we left off in last week's class. I introduced the topic this week is going to be natural living, a very interesting topic. I'd like to begin with the prayer. Divine Mother, Great Masters, Beloved Guru, may we ever be in tune with Thee, that we live naturally in accordance with Thy law, Thy universal law, Thy universal harmony. Om Shanti Shanti. Amen. As I say, this uh, topic of natural living, we have to be, I think I'd like to begin by remembering that really to be in harmony with nature's laws, to be in harmony with God, this is what all of us are uh, shooting for. We're, we're aspiring to that. And it has to be done inwardly first, you might say. But that said, we also can help that by trying to be in tune outwardly with nature's laws as well. Obviously, if you do something that uh, goes against those laws, you're going to inevitably suffer. And I remember Swami Kriyananda once saying that in reading history and studying the lives of saints, he noticed that there was a tendency in the West, spirituality in the West over the last few thousand years, there's a certain emphasis on suffering. You know, the greater you suffer, the more worthy you would be. So people would uh, intentionally take on suffering. And of course, you see this also in, in the East as well. But it seemed to be a characteristic that uh, saintliness uh, was correlated with a certain amount of physical suffering. And he was saying, one, there was a certain wrong understanding there, but it also was, it was an uh, you might say an inability to have proper techniques, uh, the ways to live in this world, the ways to practice the sp in spirituality itself. And this is one of the reasons why the masters of our lineage brought Kriya Yoga into the West in order to give techniques that we might inwardly practice in harmony with the way that spiritual unfoldment naturally takes place, the rising of the energy in the spine. But also, that's inward, but also if outwardly we live in such a way that helps facilitate that, we find that we're more likely to make progress and we're also more likely to perhaps avoid suffering. And I want to begin uh, along this line, speak uh, with a little reading from the Holy Science. And this is, we talked a little bit about this, uh, uh, about the awakening of the heart's natural love. And in that commentary that Sri Yukteswar does on those slokas, he says this, the heart's natural love is the principal requisite to attain a holy life. When this love, the heavenly gift of nature, appears in the heart, it removes all causes of excitation from the system and cools it down to a perfectly normal state. And invigorating the vital powers expels all foreign matters, the germs of diseases by natural ways, perspiration and so forth, it thereby makes man perfectly healthy in body and mind and able, enables him to understand properly the guidance of nature. So in other words, to sum this up, the heart's natural love upon being awakened within us helps us to understand properly the guidance of nature. Now, Let's, expo let's explore that a little bit. And now I, I want to explore this because uh, Swami Sri Teshvar in the Holy Science, he devotes a number of pages to this, just speaking about it. And we read the Holy Science and we come away with the obvious impression that it's a discussion of something very deep within ourselves in the inner kingdom and not too much about outwardly, you know, outward action, except he does have this one section in there 
about what does it mean to, he says, live naturally. And we awaken ourselves inwardly and we begin to naturally attune ourselves in harmony with outwardly as well. And of course, the opposite works as well. Attuning ourselves outward, living naturally, helps us be able to remove those obstacles that prevent us from being able to awaken ourselves inwardly. And he gives a certain section there, which I'm going to, I'm going to uh, go into a little bit here. But you might say that if you ask what's the, what is natural living, it correlates very nicely with what Paramahansa Yogananda said. He said, plain living and high thinking. Now, he didn't say what it means to be plain living and high thinking, but it, I think the essence we come to understand is plain living is, is having our priorities right. In other words, this modern life, we, are, we note it to be very, very complex. You know, it's, and it seems to be very getting more and more complex in, in an outward sense. But on the other hand, I think also as we rise up, there's a certain simplicity also in intuitiveness to complexity if we if we tune into it and but nevertheless i think most people would would say at certain points in their life oh everything's so complex so you know you got all of these things that are uh, pulling us in this direction or that direction and you could see that the outward expression of spirituality often is is to try to simplify one's life to reduce some of the complexities uh, that um, modern world itself seems to impose upon us, but I think it's mostly we impose upon ourselves. We make it because we we lose a sense of priority. What's what's the most important thing? And of course, we spoke about this already. The need to put the spiritual goals that we have in life. If we put those first, then we begin to fit everything else into our lives in a way that you might say um, reduces those conflicts. I know I every morning, every evening, I meditate, and that's the priority. I know I'm going to do that, and everything else fits around it. And you could sort of say, oh, I have to, I'm coming to do this, to do this video. Well, I've got to fit it around my meditation in some way, and of course I have to make accommodations. But, but you have to have your priorities right. And, but I want to emphasize here before we go too far in here that getting everything just right in our outer world is not going to guarantee that we're going to have everything just right in our inner world. And so we have to say it's the inner that really is the most important because the outer tends to reflect that. But don't disregard also the outer and taking things out outwardly living in what so Swami Sri Yukteswar here is uh, a natural living. Now he makes an interesting point. He says by and he, he, he brings up the in one of some of the guidelines that is we speak about when we teach yoga of course is the yamas and niyamas the do's and the don'ts of the spiritual life. And through the practice of yama, through the practice of niyama, it naturally brings us into harmony with nature's laws. And ultimately, it awakens the heart's natural love. We develop uh, that loving, uh, uh, the love of the heart begins to flower. And as the love of the heart begins to flower, it naturally drives out the meannesses of the heart, those things that separate us. And then he goes on to say, it makes us fit the development of the heart's natural love. And I believe I mentioned this last time. Living in harmony, practicing, uh, practicing yamas, niyamas, perfecting them to the degree we can, makes us fit to be able to practice the higher techniques of yoga, which is concentration, pranayam, pratyahara. And it, it and we naturally, as I read in the holy science, it naturally begins to cool down our system. Now, when uh, very in a very quick phrase in the holy science, he lists the the yamas. He doesn't list the the niyamas too much. He does, but he, he focused a little bit about on the yamas, the things you might say that don't do this, don't do that. And he, I noticed 
in the reading of those are very, you know, he says them as we all learn in the Raja Yoga series. But he, one, and he has his own definitions, which are very similar, except for one. And that's brahmacharya. Now, when we think of brahmacharya, well, we think of, uh, of, of uh, uh, sexuality, we perhaps be celibate, things like that. But he doesn't, he doesn't list it that way. He says brahmacharya he defines as natural living. <laughs> Now, isn't that interesting? If so, if you wanted to say, what's brahmacharya? It's, nat it's living naturally. And what is natural living? Well, you might say it's brahmacharya as well. And it's the control of the senses. And he says, modern man, uh, in animals in the animal kingdom, they live naturally because they're instinctual. Their nature has given them instincts and to draw them to the food that's appropriate for them to eat, to do what's natural. But of course, there's very little, if any, ego involved in that. And man, of course, develops an ego sense. And he says it entangles man. One of the unfortunate things of egoism is it enmeshes one in ways that are non uh, in harmony, you could say, with what is natural living for man. And Swami Sri Yukteswar then goes on to discuss at length uh, some of what he means by that. And he, he focuses quite a bit on diet. And I know this is, interestingly, this is a topic when I, uh, when oftentimes when we give an introductory class of, to, on yoga, people come, they're not familiar. It's a topic that people are often interested in. Why should I change my diet? Because I think people have a sense that that if I get my diet clean, it'll it'll make perhaps uh, it'll harmonize me more. I think there's there's a, some sense that uh, people understand this, and so we say yes, it is. Uh, Paramahansa Yogananda said proper eaterianism. In other words, don't make a fetish out of your diet, but. Swami Sri Yukteswar was, was very strong in speaking about the uh, vegetarianism being the natural diet for mankind. And meat eating itself being unnatural and actually exciting the nervous system exciting the uh, sexual organs to uh, stimulate them unnaturally, and to ultimately bring upon disease. And he goes so far to say an early death, you might say, uh, because in other words, it debilitates the system. And I think it's important to consider that and with, again, not making a fetish out of it. And Paramahansa Yogananda occasionally even did recommend a few people for their diet because their bodies somehow necessitated it is to eat a little bit of meat. But it was not, it was excluding red meat, the beef and pork and those sorts of things. And he would say, well, eat a little bit of fish or maybe a little poultry or chicken. But generally for the yogi is to stay away from meat because it's not the natural diet of the human body. And Swami Sri Yukteswar then goes on to explain a number of reasons why that, and I've, I've got to look at my notes here to get the, uh, the numbers correct. He was talking, he speaks about the digestive canal. If we look at the digestive canal of uh, carnivores, measuring from the mouth to the anus, uh, that, that's, as you might say, the digestive tract. He says in carnivores, the average length of, di of the digestive tract is three to five times the length uh, of the digestive tract, the, the length of, uh, from the stomach to the di whole digestive tract. And in herbivores, it's from the mouth to the stomach compared to the entire digestive tract. It's 28, 20 to 28, the length of the body, the stomach, uh, and the stomach has a different shape to it. And then in frugivores, or those that are fruit eating animals, it's 10 to 12 times the length of the body. And this is what 
the human's digestive tract is. And so the conclusion that Sri Yukteswar makes is that fruit is the natural uh, diet for the human. And he then goes on to speak about how if you eat meat, what happens is the meat sits and ferments in the digestive system and it gives off toxins into the body, which are very debilitating uh, to the body and very exciting, not only debilitating, but also exciting. In other words, they, they excite the senses and it's very difficult for the body to calm down. I remember when I attended my first class of yoga uh, with Swami Kriyananda, that was my first class ever of, of yoga, he mentioned some, something about this because somebody had asked about it. And uh, he said, if your yogis tend to be vegetarian. And he says, and that's what I recommend. And uh, I said, I'm going to do that. And immediately I stopped eating meat. And I think in the 50 plus years since then, I think I've eaten maybe fish, um, I think five or six times for social reasons in the first years. In other words, my parents or my my in-laws or my relatives, so I didn't cause trouble with uh, with the family. But after, probably for the last 30 to 40 years, I haven't eaten meat at all. And I think it's very helpful. So I, I don't want to overemphasize this because we have to realize the real cleanliness comes inside, not with what we eat. It's what, uh, it's what comes out of our mouth more than what goes into our mouth. That's the most important. That's the way Jesus said it. But nevertheless, keep this in mind, and Swami Sri Yukteswar uh, emphasized it. He said, also, if you look at, if you look at animals, uh, carnivores are naturally attracted to blood. You know, it, it, it often will excite the, you know, it stimulates the digestive tract, I guess, in the animals, and they, and they go for it. He says, where in most people, blood rarely excites people. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm sure there are exceptions to that, but most people are, are there's, there's, and, it's, and if you look at most meat eaters, they do not want to go out and, and kill that bunny rabbit or that, or that cow and then devour it. Now, I understand that there are some people in the business of that, and that's what they, they do, but most people are somewhat naturally... You, you, you could say they back away from it and because they don't, it doesn't repel them. But on the other hand, try to, try to feed, uh, uh, I have a nice peach tree in my yard and I have the cats come by, my, you know, I have neighbor cats. I've never seen a cat attracted to a peach <laughs> or, or, or a dog to an apple. You know, it just doesn't happen that way, but they are attracted to meat. And so look at what, what, what attracts your taste buds. It's something nice, a peach, fruit, sweet. And so uh, the conclusion that Swami Sri Yukteswar comes to, and this is what was reiterated by Paramahansa Yogananda, is the natural food is eat a food that is rich in fruits and vegetables, nuts, and, and they suggested milk as well, as, as, as well if, you're, if you like that. And that it, that is a healthy diet, and and isn't this pretty much what modern science is even recommending? And I suspect, think about it. Probably, how long is it going to be? Another hundred years, two hundred years, three? And people are going to look back on this time when people will go out and raise cattle and you know and animals, and then cut them up and eat them. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's kind of repulsive to me, but uh, but uh, I think and people were just as we look back on some of the things a thousand years ago that people did in those times that was normal to them. But I don't think in the future it will be considered normal, and it's because it's you could say it's abnormal. It's not natural living to what natural the instinctive um, uh, impulse of man. Now, I don't mean to make a fetish of this, and uh, it can cause a lot of controversy that way. But nevertheless, it cools the system and it makes it, you could say, a healthier life. Now, an interesting thing is uh, it says that we're better able, and Suryakteshwar goes 
expounds upon this, we're better able to live a natural life and to enjoy life as life should be enjoyed. Now, oftentimes people take the spiritual thinking that the spiritual approach to life as we shouldn't enjoy life, it's suffering. And even I even started these uh, classes talking about tapasya and that life itself should be tapasya, which means pain and suffering. It's not true at all. It's we should, yes, we need to sacrifice, but we sacrifice something. In other words, we offer something up in order to enjoy life. And I believe it even says in the Vedas, doesn't it say we, we should live a hundred years to and enjoy life. That's the natural life cycle of, of, uh, of a human. The first 25, of, you know, of Gorn is, is the, uh, as a student and the next is a householder and uh, then ultimately retiring and then ultimately sannyasi in the latter parts of our lives seeking God. This is the natural cycle of life and that we should thereby enjoy life in that way. And interestingly too, Swami Sri Yukteswar says, the cool living, learning to live the natural life, and I have a quote here somewhere that helps us to live our lives as a householder, as it should, as we should enjoy life as a householder, that one cannot live as a householder if one doesn't live a natural life and follow the various rules. But when one does, one fulfills one's duties naturally. And so the implication here that is that as a youngster, we learn, and then there's a period of our life when we, we raise a family, and that sexuality itself is moderated and with the primary purpose of raising children, and that's the duty of the householder is to raise children, bring them up for the next generation, and then we retire a little bit from society after the children and become, you might say, the mentor of the next generation. And then ultimately in the, in the ancient tradition, we retire from the world at, at large to be able to live uh, more naturally, inwardly. He says, must be understood, Swamiji or Sri Teshwar says, must be understood, living naturally helps us in our spiritual life, but it does not substitute it. We should note that natural living is not limited to what we do outwardly. It implies inward harmony also. And I'd like to read a quote on natural living from Swami Kriyananda. This is from Out of the Labyrinth. He says, the laws of nature govern, govern human conduct. Because human beings have intelligence they are capable, if they so choose, of denying the instincts planted in them by nature. They can also suffer as long as they choose the prison created by their ignorance. And I think that's, in a sense, what we're saying here. We, the animals live instinctually, but we can deny those natural instincts. And I think as we begin to purify the body, we begin to remove those things physically also mentally, emotionally, that are impure, we begin to become in harmony. And you could say we naturally understand the divine will for us. We're not pulled, and it's because of ego begins to diminish. We're not pulled outside of what's natural for us. And then Swamiji goes on, it soon becomes evident there are principles which, when obeyed, bring harmony both to oneself and to one's relations with the world, but which, when ignored, produce inner turmoil and outer disharmony, regardless of anybody's opinions or beliefs. Among the principles that are rooted in natural law are honesty, truthfulness, kindness, self-discipline, harmlessness, contentment, non-covetousness. Individuals, as much as nations, that have manifested these principles have found self-integration and happiness and have been capable of the highest achievements. Those, on the other hand, who denied even one of these qualities have fallen short, at least in that respect of the greatness that they might have known. Now, it's interesting he makes note here 
that this applies to individuals, but it also applies to societies at large. Now these we're speaking about are long rhythms. We just as we as individuals attract karma, so too do nations in their mass consciousness, they too attract karma. And he said various nations, you know, have various karmas that ultimately will be self, that makes it self-defeating. To live as a nation that's uh, a predator nation ultimately will suffer the consequences that a peaceful nation, those or at least who attempt to be instruments of peace will ultimately suffer the good karma for that. But these are long rhythms and I won't go into that right now. And so other things in terms of natural living that Swami Sri touched for, the company we keep. Uh, you could say associate with those, and again we talk about environment being strong willpower, uh, those whose magnetism uh, affects us harmoniously. Because we will naturally, and as I explained before, will naturally, as we spiritually develop, will naturally begin to attract people that are magnetically in tune with us and in, to, in tune with the values that we are seeking. So look at your environment and live in attunement with people that with whom share high ideals with. And you can see this is natural. This is an expression of natural living to put yourself consciously environments that are antithetical to what your ideals are is unnatural for you in terms of natural being in harmony, the reduction of, of the those things that are essentially going to take you that it, away from God consciousness. Uh, you want those environments that are going to increase your vitality, increase your health. If possible, now of course this is a little more difficult, if possible live in a place that has a natural environment in, in terms of fresh air, lots of nice sunshine, out of the pollution. Now I know this is tough in Delhi or a place like that, but uh, we have to do the best we can. To the degree we can uh, have fresh air, sunshine, natural environment, sattvic surroundings, to the degree that uh, you could say we uh, create a modern Ayodhya in our own lives to the degree we can, a place that is in harmony with nature and a place that's harmon harmonious uh, outwardly as well as inwardly. And uh, uh, let's see if he, he mentions a few others. Oh, also he says, in man the senses of sight, smell, and sound do not lead them to slaughtering animals. That was the phrase I was looking for. And so what is your natural inclinations? Now people don't understand that is because they mistake natural inclinations for their desires, to what they're attracted to, what their likes and dislikes are. And so until we learn to moderate our likes and dislikes, we're going to have a difficult time living naturally, instinctually, putting ourselves in attunement with divine will. Ultimately, this is what we want to do. To the degree that we learn to put ourselves inwardly in attunement with calmness, with peace, with joy, we, find, we will then find ourselves naturally inclined to go in the right direction. I, it's uh, one of my favorite co quotes in the autobiography of Yogi is after Paramahansa Yogananda experiences cosmic consciousness, he's asking his guru, when will I find God? And Swami Sri Yukteswar laughs at him. He says, uh, surely you don't think God's an old man, you know, uh, with the beard in heaven. He says, no, no, God is joy. He says, and then Master says something in the autobiography, he says, when he says, yes, now I understand when I experience joy in my life, even subconsciously, it's, I find myself guided to do the right thing in everything I do, even in the details. So in a sense, we're asking the question, how do I live naturally? And I think that it comes down to this, is to live in joy, 
live in peace, live in that state of divine calmness, stimulate those states, make them your reality, and you will, and then follow your inner guidance while in that state. And this is in a sense why we meditate. We meditate in order to experience that state. But then don't just jump up and go about your daily life in forgetting that. What we want to do is we live, we experience those and we retain them for as long as possible, which Paramahansa Yogananda says is the way to develop our intuition. But the degree that we can retain those inner states, spiritual states, will be guided. And to the degree that we can then recall those states in our daily life and then act in that, somehow we will be instinctually guided. Our, our natural higher instincts will guide us to do the right thing at the right time in the right way. You could sort of say we magnetically draw those circumstances even to ourselves. So this is the, this, if the, the secret of natural living is to awaken those inner states within ourselves through our spiritual practices, through Kriya, through our meditation. But don't ignore the outer as well. As you become sensitive, you'll begin to see what gives me a sense of purity. I think maybe you've experienced this as, as well as I. I noticed when I first became aware of Master's teachings and wanted to follow these teachings, I did a mental check of my life. And there were things that I don't need that anymore. Uh, you know, habits, you might say, or behaviors. I don't need that. I don't it used to be, There's a natural impulse to purify ourselves, get rid of those things and check. And you'll see when you feel joyful, when you see, feel really happy, when you feel a design state, look at yourself, look at your habits, say, I don't need that anymore. And then follow that instinct and you'll feel you'll be naturally guided toward what Swami Sri Yukteswar means by natural living and your health will improve, your inner life will improve, your environment itself will be guided to improve those as well. So God bless all of you. And I'd like to uh, invite questions if there are any. Today I'm going to look here to see if we have any in the chat box. How does one integrate our Kriya energy into our daily lives effectively to do? Well, I think you practice. It's, it's like I wouldn't I, I wouldn't isolate that the Kriya. It's the meditation is how do you how do you how do you take your inner life and express your inner life, your inner experience and everything you do on the spiritual life? How do you make that integrate everything into your spiritual life, into your daily life. And I think bringing those two into harmony is one of the great efforts of the spiritual path. And people, they, they struggle with this because we have high ideals, we have aspirations, we want God, but then we look around and we can see they're not in harmony with, with perhaps my behaviors, my ideals. And this is the struggle, but Rome wasn't built in the day as, as, as one day, as they say, this is what we try to harmonize our life with by doing. And we inwardly, we make those inwardly a reality. And then slowly the magnetism of our inner life is, is as Swami Sri Yukteswar is where I started. We develop the heart's natural love and the heart's natural love cools the system down and it actually begins to attract to us magnetically and we work in harmony with our aspirations, with our ideals, and we slowly, slowly begin to develop uh, and harmonize. Now, it, this doesn't mean that everything outside of us is going to necessarily appear to be harmonious generally, but our reaction to what's going outside of ourselves will begin to harmonize because many, many, many have been the saints who have had very difficult lives, very difficult dharmas to fulfill. But inwardly, they have God. And when you have God inwardly, then you find that the outer begins to fall into place. But again, this is why 
we don't make outward our outward expression a fetish. We complement our inner life with what we do outwardly. You can't go the other way. You can't try to make the perfect outer life and then try to be harmonious within. It just won't work that way. But you can complement it. And, what, and if you can do it, why not? Why not do those things that help you? Why not, why not take aid if it's offered? And why not aid ourselves? It's unfortunate some people, again, that, that Western mentality, I need to suffer in order to make spiritual progress. There's a, man, there's a bit of ego in that thought. I think, let God choose. And I think, want desire for God. I know some people have prayed, Divine Mother, give me all my karma. I want to be free. Let me experience. You know, that's a foolish thing to say. It's the Divine Mother. Just, you know, let her choose what you need or don't need. Pray to the Divine Mother to accept and any challenge that comes as coming from her and then do your best to meet it. But use your reason, reason, will, and, and volition as, you know, I will, I will will, I will reason, I will act, but guide thou my reason, will, and activity the highest in everything I do. God bless all of you, and I'll, I'll see you all next week. Joy to you.